My name is Jerry Lindrew, and I am uh, new at PU, um, having been here for less than half a year. And my background was primarily in the, uh, in the regulation of private sector pension plans. So um, uh, one thing that, uh, that uh, struck me when I uh, uh, came to PU was the work that PU has done in terms of uh, public sector funding um, of their pension plans. And uh, uh, Pew, over, since about 2007, has done um, a great deal of analytic work uh, along uh, with the NCSL and the SGLE and others uh, to identify the size of, of the pension funding uh, issue that are uh, facing states and localities. And uh, for the states, the gap in funding is over uh, 1.38 trillion, 750 billion for pension promises, and 627 for retiree health care. So Ohio has a lot of company. Um, private sector coverage of DB plans has been stable, uh, um, uh, but uh, there's a significant variation in public pension plans uh, among the states. Um, in terms of the generosity and their structure. Nearly 25% of all public sector workers do not participate in Social Security, and of course that's the case in Ohio. Uh, the largest group is public school teachers with roughly one million teachers uh, not covered by Social Security. For these individuals, their entire retirement in part depends upon uh, um, the pension that they will receive as a result of their work in public service. Uh, benefit generosity, however, does not necessarily coincide with Social Security participation. There's a great deal of difference between uh, private and public pension plans. Private pensions are, are vastly different in many re respects from uh, public plans. They're, they are different in terms of demographics. Um, uh, public pension plans, three quarters of all workers are age 35 or older versus uh, three out of five for, for, uh, uh, pri for private pension plans. Public plan pension plan tenure is approximately 7.8 years, which is nearly twice that of the tenure of private sector plans. Uh, ERISA has comprehensive governance uh, standards. ERISA is the federal law governing private pensions. Uh, there is no comparable uh, federal law governing pension, uh, public pension plans, and it varies state by state. The funding requirements under federal law are very strict within corridors of funding. Um, uh, there, there are no uh, uh, federal funding requirements for public plans, and this has been this is a reason that many uh, public plans have, have faced significant funding liabilities. Um, uh, the vesting of, um, of public uh, pension plans also varies um, significantly for, for private plans. 25% of all public plans have 10 years or more of uh, vesting requirements. Uh, whereas in the private sector, uh, the maximum by federal law is, is a five-year uh, cliff or uh, seven-year graded vesting. So it's a very different system. Many uh, public sector workers, um, uh, in terms of their benefits, are, are relatively low, uh, ranging on average from 13,800 in some states to nearly 30,000 in other states. So it's not an extremely generous standard, but it's a livable standard. So funding difficulties begin to develop uh, due to failure to fund pension uh, uh, benefits primarily uh, beginning in this century. Um, uh, most pe public pension plans were fully funded at the beginning of this century in, in the year 2000. Over, overconfidence in the equity markets in the 1990s gave 
a lot of pension trustees the uh, the notion that they uh, uh, that minor dips would not affect their overall uh, funding. Uh, many state legislatures overpromised colas, uh, but they did not fund the colas. In 2002, we had the first major funding hit in public pensions in the dot com collapse. And then in, in 2008, as we all know, uh, uh, we had the Great Recession. Uh, overall public uh, uh, funding of aggregates for cities, uh, uh, that's what this slide is, shows a significant drop from 82% funding in 2007 uh, to 70% funding in 2010. Nearly all states have addressed underfunding over the last few years. Half of states have published, have passed legislation three or more times, um, and they're doing this in the face of a declining revenue uh, base. Actual costs, it's a percentage of budget, varies widely, um, uh, but local budgets have increased on average about 2.4% for pension costs. Um, uh, um, and cost as a percent of uh, state budget varies widely with 3.4 percent in Wisconsin to 7 uh, percent in Connecticut. So um, um, uh, Pew uh, recently an analyzed um, uh, uh, 61 cities and found 99 billion dollars in underfunding among among 61 cities and more under underfunding in retirement health care benefits. But more about this later. Other other states, uh, uh, some states have uh, reformed their systems by increasing their retirement age, by modifying benefit calculation formulas, by increasing the vesting age. Uh, uh, and other states have closed existing plans and created new plans, less generous tiers to existing plans for new employees. They've reduced or eliminated cost of living adjustments or required pre-funding of those adjustments and increased employee contribution rates. So there's a wide range of contributions that various states uh, have undertaken. In Kansas, Louisiana, and Virginia, n new plans were established uh, for new hires. Um, uh, in, in ways by creating defined contribution plans or by creating a kind of a defined benefit plan called a cash balance plan. They have attempted to make costs more predictable and less risky for both the state and, and for employees. Um, like, Ohio, like Ohio, several other states have conducted comprehensive reviews of the pension systems while increasing employee contributions. <clears throat> uh, for pensions, um, um, uh, we recently uh, analyzed sixty one cities. Um, uh, and uh, determined that there was 99 billion in underfunding uh, in Ohio, uh, uh, and this underfunding is calculation is primarily due to the fact that there is a, a pool trust fund for localities. Um, uh, underfunding for Cleveland is at 74.25 percent by Pew cal calculation. Cincinnati at 71.77 percent. So there, uh, the, the rule of thumb. Uh, which many people recommend is that you look closely at the funding stability of a pension plan if it declines to less than 80 percent. There's no firm rule there, uh, but this is an indication uh, um, that based on this data, which is uh, based on 2010-2011 data, that these cities, uh, because of the statewide fund, are facing underfunding liabilities. The other interesting thing about Ohio is that in many cases, the cities made their routine 100% uh, actuarial uh, contribution, um, uh, but that was not sufficient due to the performance of the state fund and due to cities and localities that did not contribute. One plan uh, that um, that has been looked at by several states and 
and in particular by Kentucky, is, is a cash balance pension plan. A cash balance plan is a defined benefit plan. It differs from your ordinary uh, def uh, defined benefit plan because the individual's interest in their account can, uh, grows at a steady curve instead of at an up upwards slope as, as they become older. The funding also occurs at a steady curve. And as a result, um, uh, um, the participants can see the value of their pension benefit much more personally. Uh, in that case, uh, it resembles a defined contribution uh, plan. So they can see the growth of their, of their retirement assets, and in fact, their assets are, are growing. Five states have looked at this type of, pl of plan for some or all of their employees. And uh, uh, Kansas has adopted one. Kentucky just last month uh, signed their uh, cash balance plan for new employees. Louisiana adopted a cash balance plan that's currently being challenged in, in uh, Louisiana state courts. Nebraska uh, has established a cash balance plan. And uh, Texas teachers have uh, two different uh, types of cash balance plans. They don't know that they're cash balance plans. Uh, the participants don't, but that's what they are. So they're not all that common. They have been adopted widely by private um, uh, uh, firms in, uh, um, who have attempted to reduce the volatility and, and provide more stability to their pension plans. We were asked to um, uh, come to Kentucky um, uh, about this time last year. Collectively, Kentucky's pension systems were 53% funded. And as Aristotle uh, reminds me, uh, 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 Kentucky looked closely at Ohio's experience in terms of, of um, uh, putting all parties around the table and working towards pension reforms. The funding level in, in Kentucky um, uh, had declined every year since 2000. The legislature uh, had a, a Republican majority in one house, a Democratic majority in the other house, and, and they essentially passed legislation and knocked down legislation back and forth. But the funding situation reached such a level in Kentucky um, that the leaders of the House and, and the Senate um, uh, determined to form a statewide a working group to work their way through and ask PU in to essentially assess the pension plans. Um, so um, I am out of time here, uh, but uh, if we have a chance later, I'll, I will talk a little bit more about the work that we did in Kentucky. Thank you. Now, the history of pensions, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit. And as you can see, that it was my ancestors 2,500 years ago thought pensions would be a good idea. So it's not a new idea, okay? And uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, who actually started Ohio State with the Morrill Act, we know, established the full-fledged uh, pension system in 1862. Now, <clears throat> the history of pensions in the great state of Ohio our state teacher pension fund was 15 years prior to Social Security in 1920. Uh, public employees, 1935. School employees, 1937. The Highway Patrol, 1944. And the last statewide fund that was created by the legislature was the Ohio Police and Fire Fund. Now, <clears throat> the... Uh-oh. Yeah. I must be finished then. Um, it's important to note that the um, pension funds in the state of Ohio provide um, a significant uh, economic engine uh, for the great state of Ohio. Um, the employer's share of the contribution contributes $4.2 billion collectively to all five of our retirement systems. And in 2011, our five systems paid out $14.1 billion uh, in retiree benefits, um, including health care. And I think $2.5 billion of that $14.1 billion was in health care costs, which one of the other panelists will uh, 
talk about the healthcare component. So I, I think you can see that the, you know the investment is significant with respect to um, our our public uh, systems, and you know unlike other parts of the economy, the retiree checks they don't necessarily bury them in a backyard in a coffee can. Um, they spend them uh, out in the economy. Um, the defined benefit plan provides safe, stable, secure retirement benefit. Obviously, um, I've always felt they're a, a tool for smooth transition from employment uh, to retirement and uh, provide job opportunities uh, as well as they do pension benefits for um, for students coming in who will graduate and one day be teachers and that can happen because those teachers can retire and open up an opportunity for young folks coming out of school. Um, earlier the introduction we we're among some of the largest in the country uh, General Motors 7th, IBM 9th, PERS 15th, Sturz is 19th, and we outrank Ford Motor, and I think uh, Verizon um, is another pension fund that our funds are bigger than. Um, the history of Social Security, which we mentioned we are not part of uh, uh, a uh, Social Security state. 1935, state and local government employees were excluded. If you had a public pension plan, Social Security said you're not invited. And then in the 50s, uh, Social Security said to states who wanted to petition to get into the Social Security system that you could come in and if you didn't like it, you could get out. Now, in 1983, because once they got their hands on the money, that agreement became irrevocable. When you chose to participate in Social Security, that's where, that's where you stay. Now, in 1991, the mandated Social Security coverage for all state and local governments not covered by public retirement systems. And that was an issue that we had to deal with in the state legislature to make some changes to our retirement law. Those are the states who are also not covered by Social Security, and as you can see, some of them are pretty significant. Um, the contributions that we make in Ohio on our public retirement, as you can see, the employees contribute 10 to Social Security is 6.2. The lesson here in this slide is that we do contribute more on our retirement benefits uh, than they do in Social Security. And incidentally, public employees hired on or after 1194 contribute on earnings up to $245,000, um, which, as you can see from the second line down, the maximum taxable earnings for Social Security is 113000 Seven hundred. So public employees in the state of Ohio contribute towards their pension on more of their salary than folks do uh, in the private sector as well. Uh, the average benefit, I think Jared mentioned a couple of them. You can see that PERS uh, average twenty two thousand six hundred. You can see the numbers here, and it's it's not like anybody is getting super rich uh, um, as a retiree in any of the funds. The um, history of Ohio's pension plans, incidentally, we had started out initially as defined contribution plans, and in the 50s, the legislature provided a defined benefit formula, which we still uh, provide today. Um, police and fire was established through the consolidation of 454 local police and fire funds. We had an unfunded accrued liability of $415 million, and originally, that liability was supposed to be paid back to the Ohio Police and Fire Fund in 20 years from 1967, but the legislature kept pushing the date out um, to help the employers out, which, which uh, uh, I guess you could say didn't necessarily you know, help the fund recoup their um, um, unfunded accrued liability, the money that was owed to them. Now, Today, PERS and STRS offer a defined contribution option in those funds. Um, the history of the pensions in Ohio, the systems that work with the Ohio legislature to make a number of those statutory uh, changes, and you can see that the employer contribution rates have changed. 
um, you know, over uh, the inception of, uh, of the funds. Now, uh, we used to, back in the old days, we would, the actuary would <clears throat> tell the fund what they needed from the employers and the employees, and they would submit those contributions. And then the legislature started capping the contribution rates received from um, the employers, uh, primarily first and foremost, and then the, um, the employees. Now, um, those, those contribution rates being capped, then in the, um, uh, in the early 90s, uh, we had incorporated an actuarial analysis would have to be provided to the um, Ohio Retirement Study Council and the legislature in general on any pension increase. So because we didn't automatically have the actuary submit a bill, we still needed to get out front of any of those pension increases so we didn't end up like some of the states that Jerry had talked about earlier. Um, we'd also changed the investment authority in the 90s, went from a legal list to the prudent person. The board composition of the funds um, has also uh, changed over time. Um, all of our funds are creatures of um, uh, the state uh, legislature. Um, the board composition, you can see that in Senate Bill 133, we'd added um, an appointment of the governor, the, um, the legislature essentially, and the uh, uh, treasurer, and added another retiree. Now, <clears throat> in Ohio, pension, the issue was pension reform, not pension replacement. Um, and in 1995, we had staffed a joint legislative committee to study Ohio's retirement plans, and the changes that were made last September, <clears throat> um, we had recommended uh, 17 years ago. Um, Anti-spiking issue, increase retirement age, increase uh, the uh, actuarially reduction for early retirement. We had to take a look at that. So a lot of the things, it just takes time. Um, and the legislature <clears throat> and uh, had provided that uh, in the inception of the Ohio Retirement Study Council that they have their own independent actuary. And in 2004, Milliman has suggested that we needed to stay on top of the funding of the pension fan, uh, funds and make some of some of these changes, um, you know, back in 2004. Um, in uh, 2008, the Retirement Study Council asked all five systems to submit their 30-year funding plans. Um, again, in 2009, and uh, finally in 2012, those. Um, uh, suggestions with respect to um, um, changes were uh, were made. Now, the um, um, I think some of the other panelists are going to talk about the changes that were made uh, in the legislation. So I'll, I'll skip those slides. Um, the members and employees contribute to the retirement systems. They receive a benefit, and certainly they recycle all of the money back in to the economy. And I think the important thing uh, with respect to staying on top of uh, the defined benefits uh, in whatever state is to ensure that the baby booms generation offspring doesn't become the baby bust generation. So those are things that people are going to rely on for a lifetime. So thank you for your attention. I'm out of time according to the... Uh... <laughs> I'd like to thank Professor Sligman and uh, Haladnak for the invitation to be here. It's an honor to be here. And as uh, Gerald from the Pew Center indicated, almost every state in the country in the last few years has uh, uh, made reforms to their pension plans. Some states have gone back more than once. I was interested to hear that uh, half the states have gone back three times. I didn't know that. Uh, it's, uh, that's uh, interesting. Certainly, uh, pension reform is not new. It's been occurring for years, as long as there have been pension plans, there have been reforms going on. But really, what's interesting in the last few years has been the the uh, number of reforms in almost every state, and also the uh, the scope or magnitude of the uh, of the reforms. 
Uh, I don't think I'm alone in thinking of Ohio as a microcosm of the, of the United States. I think uh, uh, many people have, have done that over the years, and th that moniker certainly applies with regard to uh, pension reforms, by and large. Uh, the, the type and the magnitude of the reforms that were made by the Ohio legislature um, are very typical of what, uh, by and large, of what has been made around the country. Um, the Center for Retirement Research uh, published a very interesting study in February of this year in which they analyzed uh, reforms that were made in uh, 15 different states for 30-some plans, uh, including Ohio. Uh, and one of the center's overarching findings was that, generally speaking, the, uh, the reforms that had been made were calibrated uh, to be consistent with the scope of the problem. And so where there were bigger pension problems, there were more uh, serious uh, reforms made, and where the problem was not so, uh, was not so substantial, the reforms uh, were not as substantial as well. Um, that's an interesting study, and it also contains uh, appendices for each of the state that they analyzed, including Ohio. Very interesting uh, analysis of Ohio. Uh, the, the center's uh, analysis extends to the retiree health care benefits and the reforms that were made for that as well. So for those of you who have not read that, uh, I would encourage you to do that. <clears throat> One exception uh, to Ohio's reforms that are uh, unusual relative to the rest of the country has been the, was the granting of authority to uh, make Make certain changes to plan design and contribution rates to the boards. Uh, that's very unusual in the public sector. Uh, I'm sure there are some instances, but offhand I can't think of uh, instances in which uh, boards have that kind of authority. Um, speaking just for myself, I would say that the, I think that is commendable. It speaks well of the legislature to entrust the boards with that kind of a responsibility. The board members are fiduciaries uh, and uh, in that capacity charged with operating solely in the, in the interests of the plan and its participants. Uh, and as Gerald alluded to, putting that kind of responsibility uh, into the hands of the board allows the board to operate uh, in a more nimble uh, and flexible manner, avoiding some of the atmospherics that, some, uh, that sometimes the political process brings. Um, I thought it was interesting to see that the PERS board seemed to not get to that kind of authority. I'm not sure why that was. I'm not sure if the PERS board wants to have that authority to make those kind of changes. But assuming they want it, I would encourage the legislature to consider uh, granting the board that authority, uh, again, because I think that kind of authority uh, is a good idea. <clears throat> um, one of the uh, issues I was asked to address was uh, the, the uh, need for future reforms. Um, my understanding is that uh, Flick Fornia, or his actuarial firm, pension trustee advisors and, and another firm, were asked to come in and assess the uh, proposals that uh, the systems had made. Um, and my understanding of Flick's or, uh, assessment was that uh, the, the, propo the legislative proposals, which were based on the uh, systems proposals for reform found uh, that they were actuarially sound or that over the funding period they would bring these systems back into uh, um, a full funding status within the 30 years and bring the systems that were outside of the 30-year funding period back into 30 years. Um, and so first and foremost, in my view, the, the reforms that have been passed ought to be given a chance to uh, come to fruition. Uh, instability, uh, incessant changes to pension plans are not healthy uh, for anyone, particularly the long-term funding of the system. Um, these systems, of course, uh, are very long-term enterprises. They're, they're a bit akin to the uh, proverbial aircraft carrier, where you don't turn them around on a dime. It takes a while to make changes. You don't want to make changes frequently. But even relatively minor changes in the direction can have a substantial impact over time. Uh, and that's where these pension plans operate, really, is over long periods of time, 20, 30, 50, 80 years. You think of a, a, a school teacher who, who begins teaching school at the age of 25, that person could easily be in that system for 60 or 70 years. They spend a career in teaching and then retire and receive a benefit that will last them the rest of their lives. That's why it's so important to avoid point-in-time measures focusing on uh, pension plan funding conditions at any particular point and rather look at the overall trend. <clears throat> 
One of the other uh, issues that, uh, that I think will be interesting, not just for Ohio, but uh, for all public pension plans, will be this proliferation that we're seeing of, uh, of pension calculations and numbers. It used to be, until a few years ago, there was generally one set of numbers that everyone looked to and relied upon to uh, assess the, the condition of the, of the pension plan, and those were the numbers that were calculated pursuant to uh, GASB standards, uh, statements 25 and 27. Uh, those were looked to for the funding condition of the pension plan. Those were recognized as the accounting position of the pension plan. <clears throat> excuse me. And the bond rating agencies generally looked to those uh, to those numbers as well. In other words, they were fairly um, <clears throat> universally recognized as the as the single number uh, that would describe the condition and the cost of the plan. Uh, now, not so much. New GASB standards that are taking effect just in the coming months. Uh, uh, basically returning the uh, GASB calculations to uh, focus on an accounting position, not a funding position. Uh, we expect uh, public pension plans as a result of that to begin to calculate a second set of numbers. Um, first set would be to satisfy GASB requirements to recognize the accounting position of the plan. The second set to inform policymakers of the amount that is going to be needed to fund the plan. Uh, and then we're, simultaneously we're seeing uh, some of the bond rating agencies, particularly Moody's, uh, we expect others to come along as well, to define or develop their own sort of proprietary methods for calculating the condition of these plans. Some of you probably are familiar with the changes that uh, Moody's uh, is just now implementing, in which they're establishing a, uh, for their own purposes of, of comparing the condition of public pension plans, they are relying, Moody's is relying on a uh, uniform across the board investment return assumption or discount rate that's uh, tied to a particular interest rate. Right now that interest rate would be in the neighborhood of about 3.8 percent. As a result of that and the other changes that Moody's is making, uh, a public pension plan uh, that is uh, has an investment return assumption or discount rate of say 8 percent, uh, using the 3.8 percent, that pension plan is going to, the funding condition of that pension plan is going to look a heck of a lot lower. Uh, and so we believe that a primary challenge of public retirement systems right now is going to be to educate all of their stakeholders, policymakers, members of the media, employers, uh, plan participants, and others, on what the meaning of these multiple sets of numbers are. I think GASB 25 and 27 numbers were confusing enough. Now we've got three sets of numbers out there. We've got the accounting numbers, the funding numbers, and the uh, numbers that are being produced for individual bond rating agencies. Um, one of the concerns that we have about, or a couple of the concerns that uh, we have about this multiplicity of numbers uh, is that uh, in addition to causing confusion, they're also going to lead to selective use. People are going to go out and find the number that is most to their liking, fitting their perhaps ideological agenda and say that represents the condition of this pension plan. See, I told you it's not funded nearly as well as, as you were saying it was, and so forth. We believe that that is only going to increase the confusion. Uh, and uh, muddle the uh, overall understanding and policy making with uh, public retirement systems. Uh, but from a 50,000 foot standpoint, I would commend the Ohio General Assembly for the changes that they made. I particularly appreciate the fact that the General Assembly um, based their changes on what the retirement systems had recommended. No one is better qualified to understand these changes, the kind of changes that are necessary, the effect of those changes on plan participants on the employers and so on in the retirement systems and the boards themselves. Uh, not every state does that. That is, not every state relies on the retirement system uh, to provide such guidance with regard to the reforms that they have made, and I think it speaks very well of the Ohio General Assembly to have made the changes on that basis. Uh, the final point I want to make is to just talk briefly about Social Security. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, almost all public employees in Ohio do not participate in Social Security. According to my back-of-the-envelope calculation, Ohio avoids spending or sending to Washington, D.C. each year about $1.5 billion uh, that would be spent, sent by employers alone to uh, Washington, D.C. for Social Security benefits. That's the 6.2 percent uh, applied to payroll for employees of state and local government, and that is not chump change. Uh, and that figure would be matched by the employees themselves were they also participating in uh, uh, Social Security. So that's over $3 billion annually that is staying in the state of Ohio rather than going off to uh, Social Security. But there's another message about Social Security as well, and that is, of course, uh, for many or most of these uh, public employees, Social Security, I mean the uh, retirement benefit sponsored by the state and local governments, the statewide retirement plans, 
uh, is going to be the, the sole source of assured retirement income. Uh, and as a result of that, it's really as critical that these pension plans stay uh, well funded over time. And with that, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks very much. My uh, job at NCSL in recent years was to track state policy on public pension plans, which is why I'm here today. And the goal of that was for me to be able to answer my most frequent question from legislators all across the country, which was, what are other states doing on pension plans? Uh, it's been mentioned several times here that state policy has been broadly similar across the country. Uh, that's partly due to the work of organizations like the one I was formerly with in the Pew Center on the States, which do share information broadly, as Keith does as well. It also reflects the fact that the pension plans of most states were very similar until quite recently. They were almost universally defined benefit plans, and they similarly suffered the same kinds of ills of people retiring earlier than the uh, actuarial numbers had taken into account, of changes in investments, <clears throat> of legislators and governors not making adequate contributions to the pension plans. The problems spring from similar bases and not surprisingly, given a similar framework in defined benefit plans, similar problems, similar results. Uh, the, <clears throat> the short paper I was asked to write comparing pension reform in Ohio to that in the other states draws some comparisons for you, and I won't get into all of those numerical comparisons. You can look at those. If you are interested in the very fine detail, uh, the National Conference of of state legislatures website tracks legislation annually and provides an enormous amount of detail as do these gentlemen's organizations on just what those numbers are. I want to make some general points. Um, the first is that when this great round of pension revision began in the middle of the last decade, one of the things that seemed most certain was that many states would shift away from defined benefit plans and go perhaps to the private sector model of defined contribution plans or to some sort of combination of defined benefit and defined contribution plans uh, or to maybe cash balance plans. And as you have heard, a few states have done that, but not to the extent that many people would have projected back in the middle of the past decade. Most states have determined to stay with defined benefit plans as their fundamental model. And as you've heard, have revised those plans substantially <coughs> in things like the age at which a person can retire, the level of contributions, the number of years a person has to be a member before he or she is vested, uh, such variations as those. The same has been true with uh, the other subject I was asked to write about, which is retiree health care plans that though it was expected back in the middle of the last decade when states first had to publish the numbers on their unfunded liabilities, which meant in some cases the states had to figure out what those numbers were, which had not been carefully tracked, a very bad business plan. But the expectation at the time was that the publication of those numbers would lead states generally to move as much of the private sector has away from providing retiree health insurance altogether because there there's always a lot more leeway for states to act than there is with pension plans. That also has turned out to be a false prediction that although states have revised retiree health plans extensively, much as Ohio has done, many of the details are the same across the country, the plans continue to exist. So defined benefit plans remain the basic model in the 50 states, though there are far more variations on that model than there were a decade ago, but still they're the basic model. And a defined benefit retiree health care plan also remains the basic model. But there's a significant shift. 
And that's what I want to draw to your, atten your attention to this afternoon. And that is much of the cost of employee retirement is being shifted to the retiree. And that is being done through a requirement for, for higher employee contributions. That is being done by a requirement for a higher retirement age. In some cases, a smaller multiplier, which means that for the same uh, level of salary at, when a person retires, a smaller percentage will be paid to the pension as the pension in the future. And particularly in the case of retiree health insurance, much, much more of the cost of benefits is being shifted to employees through higher co-pays in some states, through trust funds being built up, just like pension plan trust funds, uh, through the removal of, of beneficiaries such as spouses and children from benefits. So that overall, though we're staying with defined benefit plans in both cases, in what you might say is the very broadest picture, we're moving toward the direction of the defined contribution model in that much more of the ultimate responsibility for retirement security is going to rest upon an individual's management of that individual's resources. This is kind of an inevitable result when you look at the nature of state finances over the past 15 years. States have suffered from not just two recessions, that of the beginning of the decade and the most recent one, but they've also suffered from a climate of opinion which almost nowhere will tolerate significant tax, tax increases. That the, the public is less willing to shift resources from their from the private sector to public purposes than it was in the 1980s and the 1990s. And as a result, there's less funding available for what used to look like highly beneficial public, res public purposes that virtually everyone agreed to. Uh, that's evident when you look at a couple of the states that have made very significant shifts in public pension plans even though their plans were fundamentally in very good financial condition. And I'm referring to Florida and Wisconsin, which have both uh, increased employee contributions and cut back on benefits. Those, those in Florida are under legal challenge. They did so because of the burden on the general fund, not because there was any imminent crisis in pension funding or because uh, they had a remarkably low, in fact, most of the both of them have had, for recent years, a remarkably high level of funding. So I would say to you that, it, that the packages of reforms we've seen here in Ohio and in the states across the country probably are not the last word on this subject. The trend over the past 15 years has definitely been to reject calls for radical structural change in pension plans and to preserve defined benefit plans. The funding challenges will remain and the calls for funding from general funds for other purposes will remain as well. Education, Medicaid will compete very severely for funding for pension plans and that will be true for retiree health care plans as well. I think the great wave of state pension reform has undoubtedly passed its peak. States have dealt with the crisis. As Keith pointed out, it's important for states to let the changes that have been made take effect. Things will take a while to work out. Funding is not turned around on a dime. But I think we'll also continue to see great pressure for further changes for more savings, for cutbacks in funding for pension plans, because I think the underlying issues that brought these about in the first place are still there. That is not to say these will succeed. Uh, states have acted with, it seems to me, great political bravery in balancing 
the needs of public employees with the desires of the public. And I think much of that bravery will continue. But I would say to you that the pressure for even more radical change is probably going to be with us for a long time. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to your questions. I was surprised, uh, Jerry, in, in your talk uh, to, uh, to, to learn that um, participant tenure, uh, one of the things you emphasized was participant tenure in, these, in, in the public sector is much larger or longer than in the private sector. And this is something that I think makes the DB plan more attractive to the public employee. Uh, one of the reasons for this, of course, might have to do with the preferences or habits of the employees themselves. But another thing that's sometimes overlooked is that, by and large, public service careers have higher educational requirements, uh, and they they tend to, and people in in those types of professions tend to have longer tenure uh, as well. Have you seen anything in Pew or elsewhere in your career that that uh, would support that sort of thing, or what would you say about that? Yes, it's it's uh, not just the tenure, but it's also the uh, average or the mean age of service. Um, which is much higher in a in a public plan than, than in a comparable private plan. Those are indicators that you have a very stable workforce, and uh, and that the pension design, this type of de design of a backloaded or a traditional pension plan, defined benefit pension plan, is is a good fit for the type of workforce that you have and. The, the design of the pension plan tends to reflect the type of workforce that you have. And uh, uh, this is a good indication that there's a nice match uh, in Ohio. That's and I have a microphone just in time <laughs> to finish my question. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Um, okay. Uh, the, oh, yeah, oh, good. Yes. Uh, let me throw this out to all the panels. If you were to rank all the states based on the unfunded liability as a percentage of assets or whatever the board was used, first for pensions and then for health care, where would Ohio fit in that ranking? <clears throat> I start with whoever is the best funded system to be ranked number one and the worst funded. Would be. Ohio would be uh, fairly in the middle. The, uh, the two big plans in Ohio especially are, are uh, uh, PERS and STRS, and PERS is in pretty good shape. I, last time I looked, they were in the 80 plus percent range. Uh, on a national basis, the average or median is in the mid-70s, uh, and PERS is in pretty good shape uh, relative to that. Uh, STRS, uh, last funding level of theirs that I looked at was uh, somewhere just below 60 percent, which of course is much below the national median or average. Uh, however, these reforms that have been made uh, within the last year are intended to bring uh, STRS to back to full funding within 30 years. Uh, and so uh, I would put Ohio roughly commensurate with the nation as a whole in terms of its overall funding condition. Well, would that be both uh, pensions and health care? That's, that's just pensions, and I'm going to tell you most of everything I know right now about retiree health care because I don't follow it that closely. But that is uh, most employers, states and cities in the country that sponsor a retiree health care benefit uh, fund that benefit on a pay-as-you-go basis or nearly so. Ohio is uh, a distinct minority in making a significant effort to actually fund its retiree health care benefit. And so Ohio is well ahead of the pack uh, in terms of its, uh, its ability, its, the funding effort that it's made to, uh, for retiree health care benefits. Go ahead, please, I mean, I just want to add to Keith's comments that the health care benefit is absolutely discretionary. I mean, that, that's something that the boards have all the authority uh, to determine contributions, who's eligible. You know, so that is not a statutory requirement. I mean, they work very hard to provide it. And I think we're probably one of the only states, a few, because I don't think there are that many people um, provide post-retiree health care um, outside of Ohio. 
Well, many provide them, but yeah. few fund them. Right, right. Yeah. Kentucky, Michigan, Alaska, and right. Ohio are, are about the only four that come to mind. Right. right. And that primarily was what pushed that legislation uh, here in Ohio, the reforms that we made, was in order to keep that health care component intact because they were going to provide a portion of the contribution increase to pay for it. But it, it's, it's really pay as you go here, too. I mean, everywhere it's pay as you go. Did you want to say something? Okay. All right. Oh, okay. We have another question. Thanks. Uh, I hope this doesn't go too far away from a lot of what we talked about. Uh, Aerosol mentioned it a little bit. I'm curious about uh, the investment decision making in public pension funds. And uh, Aerosol mentioned how Ohio has gone from a legal list, and I assume a lot of states have to, to a prudent man standard. And I wonder if uh, you, a panelist or any could comment on how many have done that. I imagine it's most, but uh, I'd like to hear how many have done that. And then the, the second question that I have, uh, and I know Dr. Seligman knows uh, a bit about this, but I'd like to uh, hear your thoughts on the shift to alternative investments. Uh, we do see not a huge portion of, of funds now investing in alternative like hedge funds, private equity, and so on, but, but an increasing percentage of investment dollars is going in that direction. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on what that means for the funds. I imagine it can impact liquidity. It certainly can impact the, the risk profiles. Uh, but uh, I'd, I'd be curious for any thoughts that, that you could offer on those two topics. And the first one, again, it's just uh, moving to the prudent man standard, and then the second one, just a, a general question on, on some of the implications you see from moving dollars increasingly to alternatives. Sure. <coughs> when Ohio moved to the uh, prudent expert uh, statute that was in in the 90s we'd done it we we had done a study and um, most of the pension funds as you mentioned went to the prudent expert now what's i think unique in ohio is when when the legislature passed senate bill 82 that dealt with the the 30-year funding provision it also provided when it gave the retirement systems the prudent expert provision Twice a year, they report their investment performance to the legislature. So clearly, you can see the, the risk and return, and, and all of those um, investment vehicles, the alternative investments, obviously the funds you know, can invest in those because of the, you know, the prudent purchase standard. But I think, if, if, I mean, some of the funds are here, and they just presented their investment performance review uh, to the legislature. And because twice a year, we can, uh, everybody in the state of Ohio can see that if their investment policy that, that the board establishes uh, mirrors their investment performance. You know, so it's not like in Ohio, you know, our trustees here watch Kramer and run out Monday and start buying timber. I mean, that doesn't happen here. So I think if, if any of the trustees, you know, could address what decisions, um, you know, that they make with respect to where they put their money, I think there's obviously a lot of uh, due diligence in Ohio, and when the legislature gave that authority, certainly they put the checks and balances in so they could see exactly what they were doing with it. Uh, thanks, Harris. Uh, just a couple quick points. Uh, just about every statewide plan now is under a prudent person or a prudent expert rule. There are a few exceptions to that, and I'm sorry I don't have a specific number for you, but it's a handful of exceptions anymore, uh, with a couple caveats there. Uh, some of the states that are not under a prudent person or prudent expert rule explicitly are virtually there, with very broad uh, permission for boards of trustees to make kinds of investments they see as suitable. And some of the states that have a prudent person or a prudent expert rule have along with that a certain set of exceptions which undermines that rule, but there are things that trustees are 
disallowed from investing in. So there's a little gray area out there in the edges, but by and large, that's the standard practice anymore. Uh, the, uh, the last 18 months or a year that I was at NCSL, I was trying to get a handle on the question of alternative investments and the extent to which boards were relying upon those and the extent to which there was a lot of coverage in the media at the time saying that uh, trustees were becoming totally irresponsible, were chasing returns, were, were you know, about to dump gigantic amounts of money. Uh, very, very difficult to do. Uh, because for one thing, uh, the definition of alternative investments is like nailing jelly to the wall. In some states, it is very, very different from what it is in other states. And it, it seems to mean about anything that is not customary stocks and bonds, but beyond that point, it can mean anything from very solid, more or less traditional real estate investments to stuff that is way out there. So uh, interstate comparisons were beyond me, uh, given also the lack of detail in some states' financial reporting. Uh, but there's, there's evidence that in the statutes that more boards of trustees across the country have authority to make alternative investments. Uh, the, the use they make of that authority, I would say, needs careful measurement. Uh, it needs better reporting. But at this point, I don't, I'm not sure that anyone knows the answer to your question. Uh, if I could uh, uh, respond briefly to the issue of uh, alternative investments um, and um, to second everything that Ron uh, just mentioned. Also, um, uh, alternative investments is a very broad and, and sweeping sort of category which covers just about everything that's not covered by bonds, equity, or real estate. Um, so there appears to be a trend in recent years to move more towards private equity um, uh, or hedge funds. Um, what their role is in the context of, of a pension plan um, funding uh, uh, varies. Um, if, if they are chasing returns, that's one thing, but uh, uh, private equity or hedge funds can also be uh, an, a type of investment uh, strategy to, uh, that offsets uh, pension fund risk. It, it can be a way of de-risking your pension plan or it can introduce actual risk. You have to go into an analysis of the actual portfolio, which is quite complex. Uh, Pew was looking at some of these um, things in the aggregate across states, and what we're finding is that the overall performance is it uh, essentially mirrors the performance of the of the rest of the plan. So you if the, if the mission were so, solely to chase returns. It's not all that successful. Marginally uh, higher, but not very much. Um, and uh, but the other thing that you run into when you look at some types of alternative investments is is very high fee structures, and and uh, it's an area where plan fiduciaries have to look quite closely and understand the actual risk uh, that is being undertaken, um, and. Um, and, and make a real assessment. One thing about private e equity, for example, is that they uh, are not transparent. And, and so you, uh, uh, it's incumbent on the plan fiduciary to look very closely at those types of investments. That's all. I'd like to comment too. Um, I definitely want to affirm the comment that the definition of alternative uh, uh, can, can be just about anything. It's many things. In 2000 or so, over 90% on average of public pension fund assets were in stocks and bonds, publicly traded equities and bonds. And public pension funds in the uh, market decline of 2000 and 2002 came to realize just how vulnerable they were with that very heavy allocation to two asset classes. <coughs> and the movement toward alternatives, and now on average pension funds have roughly 15% uh, allocated to alternatives. 
Uh, again, an alternative can, be, can mean many things from a long short strategy to infrastructure to timber to a lot of other things. Uh, to illustrate one, just as an interesting point, that there's a large public pension fund that is either the sole or majority owner of Heathrow Airport in, uh, in London. Provides a very consistent stream of revenue over decades they've, they've been able to see that. I, I don't think that would be considered a particularly risky investment. But there's also a notion out there that uh, public pension funds have invested in alternatives in order to chase returns. In fact, uh, a major, if not the primary, purpose for uh, increasing the allocation to alternatives has been to diversify the portfolio and either reduce the overall risk of the portfolio or maintain the same level of risk uh, with a higher expected rate of return. Sometimes public pension funds are accused of taking undue levels of risk. Keep in mind, 15% on average public pension fund allocation to uh, alternatives. According to the National Association of College and University business officers that conducts an annual study of their foundations and endowments uh, who are their members. The average allocation to alternatives, and this allocation includes, uh, their definition of alternatives includes real estate. Average allocation to alternatives among large foundation, college, university foundations and endowments, 60%. I just want to raise the issue of uh, keep hearing about uh, public uh, pension envy. You know, the public is jealous that the public employees get a better benefit. And here's your numbers were um, employer contribution 10%, employee 14, 24% contribution. Social Security total of 12.4. Uh, the average benefit was 24,000 plus. I don't know what the average Social Security benefit is, but. How do we address people, and I know you, you've heard this a hundred times across the screen, how do we address the fact that public employees, are, I mean, is it, is it a false assumption that the, the, the public employees really have better, better than, than uh, private employees? I mean, is the, is the public justified in, in being envious about a public employee and the benefits they get? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think um, uh, all of our jobs is to uh, obviously enlighten folks uh, with the facts. And I, I think that, that you know, pension envy obviously, you know, takes on political ramifications in, in, in a nature of our public pension with fiduciaries as trustees. You know, where the sole, their sole job is to provide the benefit for the beneficiaries. And there's very little distraction. I do think that, you know, we have to take a bigger look at the whole pension issue with respect to, you know, um, a fiduciary responsibility on everybody's part. And, and I know that, uh, uh, you know, the Vanguard group and Bold and you know, started Vanguard, uh, uh, you know, believes that there ought to be some fiduciary role for folks in any investment business. And I, I do know that uh, Phyllis Borzi, uh, who's participated in a number of, um, you know, panels with uh, uh, folks, uh, has tried, um, you know, to have that issue, you know, kind of teed up for people to look at. Uh, so I, I think it's just that, you know, at, at times, Things like that can be, you know, self-fulfilling prophecies, but I think the, the more that folks get out and educate people and our pension fund boards do their due diligence, uh, as you can see from the slide, there, there are not a lot of people getting rich and they do pay more um, on um, uh, for and on their salaries for a benefit. But I think that issue is going to be around uh, for as long as, as long as there's a pension discussion, in, in my opinion. I get 6.2 percent. Public employer pays 14 percent, and that money comes from either tax. It's not fair. Look, and that's the kind of I've talked to a number of legislators. You have too, and, and I'm sure you've been asked the same question. And I don't know how to answer that. Well, I have. Here, it's in these conversations, 
and just as, as just as you just did, we often go down to just two components. You have the six two and the ten or the fourteen, whichever side you're talking about there. Uh, but the, most of our private sector, the vast majority of it, also contributes to social security. So when you add the 6-2 and the employer's contribution to a DC plan or whatever sort of plan they have, uh, you, you don't come up with just the one number. And a lot of the popular press, including in town here a couple years ago, a very nice Sunday section in the dispatch where they went into uh, the, uh, the generosity of public benefits, that they failed to actually mention that the public sector in Ohio is, 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 does not participate in Social Security. And that is, that is, I think, one of the moving parts that people often, often miss. During my little talk was um, there is a substantial difference, substantial differences between the workforces, between public and, pro and private sector. And um, public sector workforces tend to be longer term, tend, uh, they tend to be higher educated, they, they tend uh, to be older, um, but um, uh, uh, studies that have been done have, uh, that have attempted to assess the comparability of, of, of public and private um, sector payroll and benefits have found that usually in the public sector, public workers have a somewhat lower payroll and somewhat better benefits. From a, from a view, the viewpoint of retirement income policy, um, uh, the type of, of pensions that is offered in most uh, uh, public sector workforce um, is a much better type a pension uh, from the viewpoint of, of the individual. And uh, right now, defined contributions are prevalent in the private sector. Uh, the private sector is, there is an increasing demand um, to have the kind of, of pension benefits that public sector workers have because in, in a private sector setting where an individual in a defined contribution plan is responsible for their own financial well-being and, and, and structure, it is almost impossible for, uh, for, a, for an individual to match the performance of pooled assets professionally managed. And, and in a private sector workforce, there, from a retirement policy point of view, um, uh, the Gen X generation, uh, the, the late group baby boomers, are going to be facing very significant and serious re retirement challenges in the future. And this is going to be a conversation that we're going to be having in the next 10 or 20 years um, as, as uh, these generations move through our, our workforce and begin to face retirement. All right, Thank you. Uh, I'm a trustee in one of our retirement funds, and I wanted to go back to the alternative investments and affirm what um, most of you said, which is that you're trying to optimize risk-reward with paying attention to the constraints of cost and liquidity. And my perspective is not only that of a trustee of one of the retirement systems, but as an uh, employee of the property casualty industry for 30-some years. And the property casualty industry, we need our liquidity for more Oklahomans. You never know when more Oklahoma is going to happen. All of a sudden, every bit of liquidity you have has to be put into play, and you're going to pay one heck of a, a claim, a set of claims. But in the retirement world, not everybody's going to die tomorrow. They're not all going to die two weeks from now, uh, unless there's that alien invasion, which you know could happen. But um, I put that as a pretty low uh, percentage. So I, I think most of them are doing a pretty good job, and they're, I want to affirm what uh, this gentleman from Hugh just said, is that if you had asked me, I'm quote unquote the investment expert on the board, which is, you know, can be debated, um, that if you had asked me at age 30 what I was doing about retirement, I wasn't thinking about it one bit. 
and that is the beauty of the public policy of the retirement systems is that most 30 year olds were just like I was at 30 years old. Um, you're thinking about your babies, you're thinking about your career, you're thinking about the house you're going to buy, and retirement is so far in the future that you just don't even realize it. So I think the public policy of defined benefit plans is a huge benefit to society. The second thing I wanted to say, which was to shift the conversation a little bit, is to say I think that these conversations are going to need to continue to occur because my observation as I've watched the generation above me pass is that medical science is way out ahead of the wallet. And uh, here are my parents who never exercised, drank too much, smoked everything, lived into their 80s, but their parents died in the 70s, so the whole demographics thing is going to continue to shift. And if you're alive at the old age that I am right now, I can expect to live into my 90s. And I'm not sure I got enough money saved or my, my, uh, everything's going to work that way. So I, I think we're going to have these conversations over and over again as the uh, medical doctors do what they do best, which is keep us alive. Well, maybe that gives an opportunity just for a second to switch into uh, retiree health care uh, on that last point and, and to ask uh, whether or not there's any salience to the idea that things like the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act or recent reductions in medical cost inflation will make these benefits easier or or, uh, or or more seamless to deliver in some other way. Any comments on that from Ron or somebody else? No. <laughs> um, it, it has been fairly common that, that people retire prior to Medicare eligibility age and, and uh, Many of these retirements are not, well, about 50%, I understand, uh, of, the, of these retirements are not retirements that the individual chose for. Um, and consequently, when you're in that age category, your health need is beginning to increase. And, and your need to have medical insurance coverage uh, to fund your health needs is much greater. And uh, th there has been a real gap, uh, especially between the ages of 55 and 65, or, uh, in terms of, of access to affordable health insurance uh, for people who retire early or who lose their positions and, and are unable to find employment elsewhere. The Affordable Care Act will uh, uh, definitely help with respect to providing health insurance for these individuals. Um, and uh, I think that that's probably all I want to say, although I, I will note that Rahm Emanuel has, has indicated that he wants to move Chicago's uh, retiree health system into a, a complete reliance on the uh, uh, health exchanges that are being structured in Illinois as part of the strategy of, of getting control of Chicago's uh, um, uh, benefit plan expenses. I, I, I would agree with uh, Jerry because the, a very expensive component of um, our retirement systems is the post-retiree health care. And you hit the nail on the head. It's people retire prior to uh, Medicare eligibility. So I think any effort who would help uh, with respect to expanding the pool and, and make health care uh, less expensive for um, uh, our retirement systems would be uh, uh, would be a welcomed uh, alternative, at least to keep a very close eye on it. Because, you know, when when the legislature granted the pension funds the discretionary authority to provide health care to the retirees, it was free. I mean, it was virtually free. It was free everywhere. I mean, it was free in the workplace. That negotiated, you know, with with, uh, with employees, between employees, because it was 
not expensive. And uh, it has become a very, very expensive component in the changes uh, that the retirement systems made with respect to the defined benefits a lot of what drove the entire debate was the cost of health care. So I think any effort uh, and any help the funds could get from anywhere would, would be helpful to sustain uh, the defined benefit. And and I, th I think that this log jam we're talking about with with young folks coming out of college as the one jobs if people can't retire and the X generation hasn't saved enough money, we're in for a pretty rude awakening with respect to, you know, uh, the unemployment figures in America.